Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Perplexity, a mystery podcast. As always, I'm your host, Kadra, and I'm super excited you guys are here listening, joining me today for another great episode. I have a fun and crazy and scary, all at the same time, story for you guys. Uh, this story was actually recommended by my dad, and the movie that this true event is based on is a movie that I watched as a kid, and it scared the shit out of me. <laughs> um, it's a great movie. But before we get into the story of the ghost in the darkness, also known as the Savo Man Eaters, a couple of quick housekeeping things as always, as we are at the top of the show. First of all, some announcements. If you haven't listened to them yet, I have released two, count them, two bonus episodes. Uh, one of them is a podcast exclusive. You cannot watch it on YouTube. It is only going to be available on podcast platforms, audio only. Um, I did a story where I basically did a no sleep story from Reddit and read that, tried my best to do some different <laughs> voices. So Take from that what you will, uh, but it's a creepy story. I just read it for fun. The story is not real, but I thought it might be a fun little bonus episode, and I might do more like that in the future. Uh, and then the other bonus episode that is out is a listener sewed. So I told two listener stories, and then I also had a listener ask for my thoughts about the Titan submarine disaster and some other current events. So I shared my thoughts on some things there. So... If you guys have already listened to those, please let me know your thoughts. Uh, you can take the polls after each podcast episode as well to let me know your thoughts, or you can pop the comments down below in the YouTube videos as appropriate, just to let me know what you want to see more of. And I do plan to do more bonus episodes in the future, but it's definitely not going to be a weekly thing. It'll just be whenever I have extra time, as I do have a job, <laughs> but they are very fun. So if you have more ideas for those, let me know. If you've been liking what you've been hearing on the podcast, of course, you can always leave a five-star review, please and thank you. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can thumbs up videos, you can hit the bell icon in the top right corner to get notifications for new videos, and you can of course subscribe to the YouTube channel. Those are super easy ways and the best ways to support the podcast, support the show, and if you've already done so, thank you so much. Oh, also, really quickly, if you guys listened to the Bloody 66 episode or the Mysteries of Route 66 episode, if you're watching on YouTube and the audio sounded bad, apologies. I recorded the entire episode before I realized I didn't have the adapter plugged in to my microphone. So like the audio was running through my iPhone where I do video recording instead of being beautifully filtered through my professional microphone. So <laughs> I had to like run it through Audacity and try to clean it up and I did the best I could, but you can't clean up audio that's already not great. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, hopefully it will never happen <laughs> again. Got it all hooked up today, so we're good. But live and learn. Also, since moving into a new house, there's been way more traffic. I live by a much busier street, so I'm just trying to get used to recording in a new environment. As always, for other ways to support the podcast and to contact me, check those links out in the episode description below. And also sources that I will be using today will be available in the show notes, though I will mention a couple verbally just as we go through. Trigger warning for today's episode, this episode will contain violence, a little bit of gore, disturbing content. Listener discretion is advised, especially for listeners below the age of 13. So like I said at the beginning of the episode, today we are going to be talking about the Savo Man Eaters, also nicknamed The Ghost and The Darkness. And the movie that I watched as a kid came out in 1996, and it was called The Ghost and the Darkness. So it is based on true events, but as many movies do, it does take some liberties and change a couple of things. So today I'm going to be telling you the true story about the Savo Maneaters. 
So first of all, one of the central people in this story is a lieutenant colonel named John Henry Patterson. And after all of this happened, he actually wrote a book detailing his whole experience, and he called it The Man Eaters of Savo. And this book came out in 1907, so all of this happened a pretty long time ago. And a lot of what I'm going to be telling you today is based off of his direct account from the book. With that being said, this is an account from a single person, so who's to say if things were inflated or not, uh, which we'll get into more towards the end of the episode. But just FYI, a lot of this account comes from Patterson and no one else. Um, Also, we'll get into some expert studies that were done years later about this, and then you can just kind of take with this information what you will. The movie, in case you were curious, stars Michael Douglas and Val Kilmer. And it's a pretty good watch. So if you are interested in this story and you want to learn more or you just kind of want to see a movie adaptation of it, check it out. So our story begins at the top of March, way back in the year of 1898 in Mombasa, Kenya. During this time period, a railroad bridge was being constructed over the Savo River to be part of the Ugandan Railway. And this was a huge project because basically the goal was for this railway to link Uganda and Kenya with the Indian Ocean port of Mombasa in Kenya. So the railway was supposed to disrupt the traffic of slave trade, kind of cutting off slaves from the source in the interior to the coast. So the British could transport people and soldiers, and this could help them remain dominant over the African Great Lakes region. And it was Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson who was hired by British Parliament to oversee a big part of this project. He was basically in charge of the part of the project in Mombasa, because it was a a huge railroad, but he was in charge of this one area. And the workers that helped so much in constructing this rail line came mostly from British India, but there were also quite a few African workers. And one thing I thought was interesting while I was researching this is during the recruitment period for this project when they were hiring workers, there was actually a big plague that broke out in India And so the Indian government was restricting recruitment and immigration in response, and they actually created a quarantine camp, and anyone who was being recruited for the project had to be quarantined for 14 days. Sounds an awful lot like what we just experienced in 2020 with COVID-19. So... We can't act like this has never happened before, because it actually did over 100 years ago. (laughs) Just thought that was interesting. And thousands and thousands of workers were recruited, because as I said, this was a massive project. 37,000 workers were estimated to have been recruited for this. They signed a contract for about three years, and the British Indian workers would get paid about 12 rupees per month, which was a lot back then. They also got free rations and returned to passage. And if they were ill and needed to go to the hospital for any reason, they actually still would receive half pay and free medical attendance. So for a lot of people during this time period that were desperate for cash and had a good deal like this, this was a pretty sweet gig if you could put in the labor. In Patterson's book, he calls these British Indian workers coolies, which I found out is a racial slur that is um, not going to be used in this episode. So we're not going to call them that, okay? But if you read the book and you see that, that's what they were called back then. But during the construction of the railway from 1895 to 1903, about 2,500 workers actually died. And a lot of this was due to the poor conditions. It was very dry. There was a lot of intense heat. Um, And of course, just all of the labor could put wear and tear on the body. But some of these deaths were due to the Savo man-eaters, which we will get into. 
The railway also had quite a few critics as far as the construction goes because it was a very expensive project. Members of parliament began to call the railway the Lunatic Express, basically saying that it was so insanely expensive, so many resources were being used, it was going to take so long to be built that the only reason this could be built was out of sheer lunacy. But there were also people such as Winston Churchill that saw the project as a brilliant conception. So going back to Mombasa, Kenya, where the construction began when Patterson was there, Mombasa is actually known as the Island of Lore, and there's a lot of history of bloodshed in this area. There are also interesting beliefs in folklore there, including that of demons. The building site included several camps spread over eight miles or 13 kilometers, and this is where the workers would live, eat, sleep, and construction in this area took about nine months. At the start of construction in Mombasa, the area was green, lush, scenic, and as they built closer and closer to Savo, the region became drier and much more desolate with really harsh conditions to work in. However, this did not seem to deter the workers. The construction was coming along nice, everything was according to the timeline, However, soon after Patterson's arrival, he ordered extra tools to ensure nobody was sitting idle, just in case they weren't already working hard enough. The first full day that Patterson was there, workers began to tell him about a lion attack where a worker was killed. But Patterson didn't really take this seriously at this point, and he essentially ignored this concern. Plus, there was no body to be found, so he thought maybe the workers had actually jumped this worker and killed them for their valuables. And a little backstory on Patterson, he actually had experience hunting tigers because of his military service in India. So one of the first people that Patterson met after arriving to Savo was a man named Singh. And Singh was a Sikh man and also a member of an ancient class of Indian warriors called Jemadars. And Singh's job was basically to help keep the peace both internally and externally. He had been there for a few weeks at this point, and he was very hardworking, he was attentive, and Patterson was quite fond of him. And when they would have morning meetings, he was always there. But one morning... Singh did not show up for this morning meeting. And Patterson knew that this was not like Singh, so he immediately became concerned, and he started to ask the other workers if they had seen him. This is when some of the workers told Patterson, quote, the devils took him. So after investigating Singh's tent, Patterson found distinct lion prints, blood, heel and human handprints, and drag marks. So it's not looking great for our guy, Singh. Other workers who shared a tent with Singh claimed that the night before, around midnight, a devil burst into their tent and grabbed Singh by the throat. They heard Singh say, let go, and try to grab the lion by the neck. But after that, they never heard him say anything else. He wasn't seen or heard from again. So after getting this information, with his hunting and tracking experience, Patterson tracks this lion, and he finds multiple points where the lion had stopped to feed. Multiple pools of blood were found at each stop. After several miles of tracking the lion, Patterson found what was left of Singh. There were various bits of flesh and bone and his head. So this is obviously a horrifying discovery. And after he gathers himself, Patterson looks at the tracks more carefully. And this is when he makes another startling discovery, as if this couldn't get any worse. Not only is there a set of lion tracks in the dirt, there is a second set of lion tracks in the dirt. 
So Patterson now has to worry about two man-eating lions. Workers worried that the lions were the evil spirits of two shamans who didn't want the railroad to be built. And it was the workers who gave these lions the nicknames Ghost and Darkness, hence the name of the film in 1996. So because it is ultimately Patterson who is in charge of this whole project in this area, he has to come up with a plan to deal with these lions. So he decides to make a strict curfew for the workers, and he also camps up in a tree that night. And he does this because he hopes that the lions will return and he'll be able to get a good shot and shoot them. He camped out that night with a younger boy who was a worker, and he got along with this boy very well. And in his book, he refers to this young boy as boy. Close to midnight, Patterson heard the lions roaring nearby. At several points, he could even hear them breathing because they were so close to him. But from the sound of it, it was pretty dark, so Patterson couldn't really see what was going on, and he was ultimately unsuccessful in catching either of the lions. So a few hours go by, and nothing happens. But eventually, Patterson started hearing workers screaming on the other side of the camp, about a half a mile away. And he would later find out this was when another victim had been taken. So Patterson's next plan was to use two goats as bait. He did this the very next day, but he heard screaming later in the night in a different area of the camp. Instead of taking the goats, the lions had taken another human victim. So this is like one a day at this point. It's happening back to back to back. Blood, paw prints, and this time fingernails dug into the sand were found at the victim's tent. Horrifying. This tent was also in the interior of the camp, which would mean that these lions fearlessly walked past hundreds, if not thousands, of workers to the middle of the camp and hand selected a human victim and dragged them out again walking past all of these humans so these lions they're bold so after this patterson decided that it would be a good time to temporarily suspend work on the railroad and he instructed everybody to move their tents inwards much closer together and he did this number one because strength in numbers. And number two, because everyone's now much more together, the land has much more like openness because there's a lot of brush in this area. So by basically moving the camp to one more central area, he could get a clearer shot potentially of these lions. And just to paint the picture of how much he changed the landscape here, the camp went from being about eight miles long to just one mile long by doing this. He also instructed all of the workers to gather thorny bushes and build a protective wall around their camp called a boma, and this was to help keep the lions out. They even lit fires at night and constantly kept those going, and they had a system of pots and pans tied up all around the camp to serve as alarms. But despite all of this ingenuity... Over the next eight days, there would be seven more victims. And this is going to be a pattern. So Patterson, in response to this, set numerous traps, but all failed. There were two people that narrowly escaped death. One of the workers was sleeping in his tent one night when a lion began pulling his mattress out of the tent by its teeth. Luckily, the worker woke up quickly and rolled off the mattress just in time before the mattress was pulled out of the tent. So when the lion pulls this mattress out of the tent and realizes that the mattress is empty, he basically was caught off guard. And then the lion just ran off. So with all of this chaos, progress on the railway is also being disrupted. Because think about it, they're all terrified. They have 
fires going all the time. They're having to build all these extra things to like watch out for the lions. So this is taking up a lot of time. And of course, people are also getting sleep deprived. Also, just a quick aside, these lions were later found out to both be males and males do not do a lot of hunting. It's actually mostly the female lions that hunt. And more often than not, when lions hunt, they're unsuccessful. So for there to be two male lions hunting together in a pair, which is also rare, and for them to be this successful, like this is an incredibly rare instance. Also, because of the sheer size of the camp and the fact that they were being hunted, the lions learned to wait to feed. Meaning, once they had a victim, they would drag the person for miles before they would eat them instead of doing it close to camp. So we don't know for sure when exactly these victims were killed, but it's pretty horrific to imagine potentially being alive while being dragged for miles in the jaws of a lion. Now, like I said, some of the workers were shaken up, scared, but there were a lot of workers. And for the most part during this time, the workers ultimately weren't too concerned. They basically figured the chances of them being selected were pretty slim because there's thousands and thousands of them. But this would all change as construction continued. Eventually, the railway construction started on a bridge. And this is when the camps were split into two. Some people continued to work on the railroad while others started working on the bridge. And this would cut their numbers in half and would double the chances of them being eaten or attacked by lions. So this is when other workers started to change their mindset more and more and get more and more worried. And they set up more bomas, they set up more traps, they made sure fires were constantly going, but this would of course result in the railroad taking much longer to build because their minds and their energy are elsewhere. So at this point, the government that's overseeing this project is getting pissed off at Patterson and they're like, what is going on? Why does construction keep halting? Why is this taking so long? And Patterson doesn't want to disappoint the people in charge. So he's trying more and more things to get these lions killed or caught, but to no avail. The first night in their new camp, a worker left the medical tent to go relieve themselves and was met face to face by one of the lions. So this man was so startled, he actually tripped over a table and there was glassware and pans all over the table. But this noise actually scared the lion and caused him to run off. But then the lion accidentally ran into a medical tent and this resulted in injuring two patients and even killed one person in the tent. And this medical tent seemed to be attracting the lions which would make sense because there's patients in there, there's more vulnerable people, like easy targets. So Patterson catches on to this, and he started staying up all night near the tent with multiple guns on him. And he would lay in wait, and each time that he did this, screams would be heard from the opposite end of the camp. So it's like these lions knew what he was going to do. So while he's watching this medical tent, the lions take another unsuspecting victim. And this guy's job was to deliver water to the other workers and to the medical tent. A witness that saw this all happen said the worker was sleeping when the lion stuck its head into the tent and grabbed the man by the foot. In an attempt to save his own life, the man grabbed on to one of the tent's ropes but the rope broke and the lion eventually just bit the man's throat, which killed him instantly. So here's my other major question. With all of these deaths, where the heck are these people's weapons? Like Patterson has multiple guns, but it sounds like nobody else really did at this time. It's just baffling to me. How are they defending themselves? 
So <laughs> with all of these bomas too being built around the camp, the lions were starting to just crawl right through them. So these thorns are being stuck into their skin, scraping them, scarring them, cutting them. And bomas were commonly used in this area to deter predators, but these lions just did not care. They were going right through them, bleeding to get their prey as if nothing happened. Many of the workers were convinced that these lions were possessed by some sort of demonic entity. They seemed to be ignoring any other prey and going out of their way to hunt humans. Patterson's next attempt to catch the lions involved sitting in a wagon that belonged to another victim that had recently been taken. They also had goats near the wagon to help serve as bait. So Patterson sat in the wagon late that night with another worker, and each of them had guns. One of the lions eventually leapt onto the wagon, attempting to attack the men. Both of the men fired at the lion, but missed, and the lion was not seen again. So this is the other thing that makes this so difficult. It's like, they're in the middle of the African wilderness. It's pitch black, and they're surrounded by brush all the time. So getting a good shot was damn near impossible. And after this lion leapt out of nowhere at the wagon, it shook Patterson up so bad and this other worker that they just stayed in the wagon the rest of the night. They were too scared to move. And at some point during this event, one of the goats that was tied up disappeared. But Patterson and this other worker never saw or heard anything. So they were really shocked when this goat had disappeared. After this incident, the lions actually didn't return for several months. So the men at Patterson's camp were relieved. They were celebrating. They thought that Patterson had maybe killed the lions or that, I don't know, that they were just done hunting. But Patterson knew very well that the lions were alive. They had not been killed. And he knew this because he was getting reports from other camps that other victims were still being attacked and killed by these lions. But Patterson did not tell his men about this. He accepted their celebrations and um, awe of him. So I found that pretty annoying. And some of the workers also allegedly at some point actually set up a plot to kill Patterson. So I'm not sure what caused the workers to turn on him. I mean, I could imagine they're under a lot of stress and frustrated that things aren't getting done. But still, like that's about all I could guess here. Several dozen workers planned to jump Patterson near a ravine, but somebody actually warned Patterson about this. And so when they get to the ravine and all of the workers were standing around Patterson, he basically was just like, so which one of you is going to do it? And only one guy tried to come up and do anything. He like stepped forward and tried to hit Patterson. But Patterson was having none of this and just like sidestepped him. And the guy like fell. And he was just like, I'm not doing this. Get back to work and walked away. <laughs> So in the absence of attacks, the workers at Patterson's camp also started to get more comfortable sleeping outside under the stars, which is why I got annoyed. Like, when people think that the threat is gone, they relax and things happen. And it was also insanely hot during this time, so they were sleeping out of their tents to basically get more airflow. But one of the nights that they did this, the lions took another victim. This lion forced its way through the boma again, and an alarm was sounded, projectiles were thrown at it, and the lion was also shot at with guns. But the lion continued on its mission, completely unbothered, and the lion actually ran towards a group of workers, and once again, hand-selected a victim, and took its time before leaving. It like had the guy in its mouth and is just kind of looking around, walking all around the boma, like 
What's the best way for me to leave? What's the most convenient? And additionally, this lion consumed this man just 30 yards from the tents. So they're getting more and more comfortable feeding closer to the camp, and they're just completely unbothered by the human's attempt to do anything about this. And this is also when the lions stopped feeling the need to sneak into the camp, and they started roaring each night to announce their arrival, which I feel like is actually worse, like knowing that they're there and there's nothing you can do about it. These attacks would continue for 10 months, and Patterson was completely hopeless by this point. A lot of the workers also had had enough of this, and they left, and the workers that remained weren't really sleeping either. So one night, with the few workers they had left, the pair of lions took another victim and ate him just behind Patterson's tent, almost as if to mock him. Patterson recalled hearing the lions purring and crunching on the man's bones as they ate. The other nearby workers were so horrified, they actually went into Patterson's tent just to feel safer. Which I think again confirms for me that these people don't have weapons. But when these workers arrived to the tent, Patterson realized they had left one of the ill workers behind. And so Patterson was like, uh, we need to go back for this dude. So he went to go check on the ill man and discovered that this man had died of shock from being left behind. So with Patterson and the other workers getting more and more desperate, he wrote to a district officer nearby named Mr. Whitehead. And Mr. Whitehead claimed to be an accomplished big game hunter. Eye roll and asked him to (laughs) bring along some other men to help take out these lions once and for all. But Mr. Whitehead didn't arrive as scheduled. So when he didn't show up, a day passed, and Patterson found Mr. Whitehead, and he was basically like, what's going on? Why didn't you show up yesterday? And Mr. Whitehead claimed one of the lions had nearly did him in the last night. He had large claw marks across his chest, and he claimed one of the lions had leapt through the rail yard where he was at and tried to attack him. But he shot at him, and the lion ran away and instead took another worker. So Patterson and Whitehead hatch a plan, and they decide to build a large box with a divider and a trap door. And this is one of the more famous traps that is discussed in this whole story. Surrounding the box were tons of bomas, and on the other side of the divider was a man with a gun. So basically, the lion would see this man, this lovely dinner, waltz in, the trap door would fall, and the lion would be on one side, there'd be this divider of like wooden logs, and the man would be on the other side with the gun to shoot the lion. And the lion can't get out because it's trapped in by the trap door. So that was the whole plan. Uh, The door was operated by like some type of switch device or lever. So the first night, Patterson sat in the box. And once again, he heard screams on the other side of camp. The next night, Patterson sat up in a tree and ordered some of the workers to sit inside of the trap. And this was, of course, when one of the lions entered the trap. The workers were so scared shitless that for a full minute, they're just screaming and in full panic. They're not firing their weapons at all. And finally, they started shooting at the lion, but they somehow managed to miss the lion. And there's like two or three workers in this box and they all have guns and every single shot somehow missed this lion. And... As if that wasn't bad enough, one of the workers shot the lever, basically, that was like controlling the trap door. And this caused the lever to move and for the trap door to open. And then the lion escaped. It's like a freaking horror movie cartoon. 
After several unsuccessful days of hunting, Mr. Whitehead and his crew were so frustrated that they left. Soon after, Patterson heard one of the lions had been sighted near the river eating a donkey. So Patterson went quickly towards this area, along with several workers, and they had pots and pans, and they started, like, bashing them together to basically scare the lion and force it out of the brush. So this actually worked, and soon Patterson was face-to-face with one of these humongous lions. It was only about 15 yards away from him. So, with his gun ready, he aims, takes his shot, and the gun jams. And the lion gets away. Yeah. So when the lion ran away, it left the donkey's carcass there. And so he tied the donkey's carcass to a tree that night. And then he climbed up the tree and waited. Then around midnight, he heard twigs snapping beneath him, and he also heard heavy breathing, like sighs. And eventually, Patterson realized the lions were there, but they had no interest in the donkey carcass. They left it completely untouched, and they seemed to be frustrated that Patterson, this delicious human, was out of reach. Patterson was so still and didn't move a muscle to the point where he was hit in the head while he was up in the tree. And he later realized that this was an owl attempting to land on his head because the owl thought he was a tree branch. So Patterson gathers himself. And by this point, Patterson still didn't have a clear shot, but he could hear these lions. He knew they were very close and he had a general idea of where they were. So Patterson takes a shot and he hears a lion let out a massive roar. So this led Patterson to take several more shots. And at this point, he didn't want to track the animal at night. He didn't think that that was wise. So Patterson stayed up in the tree the rest of the night. And first thing in the morning, he tracked this lion. Just about 100 yards away, he found the first lion's body. The lion was nine feet and eight inches long, with eight men having to carry this lion back to camp. So it's absolutely massive. The lion's skin was also visibly scarred from climbing through the bomas again and again. This lion also had no mane. It was maneless around the neck. So while this was a huge victory, Patterson still had another lion to catch. Ten days passed with no activity, but one night another victim, along with a goat, were killed. Soon after, in the night, Patterson and another worker set up camp to hunt this other lion. And each person had a gun, so about at 2 a.m., Patterson saw movement in the brush once again. He waited until the lion was about 20 yards away before firing at the lion's chest. The lion growled and took off. The next morning, they tracked the lion, but this time, the lion wasn't dead. They heard low growls coming from within the brush, and they were so close to the lion, Patterson recalled he could see the lion's teeth. So Patterson aims his gun and takes another shot. And this is when the lion jumped up and charged at him and this other worker. And Patterson, while the lion is basically leaping through the air, takes another shot and the lion falls down. But it quickly got back up again and charged at them again. So Patterson fires again and same thing happens. The lion keeps falling down, getting right back up and charging at them. And he shoots it and it falls right back down, gets right back up, charges at them. It just keeps happening over and over again. And eventually... Patterson is out of ammo, okay? So he reaches for the gun of his companion, reaching, reaching, and there's no gun. And he turns, and there's no companion. And (laughs) this companion, luckily, was not dead, but he had run up a tree with his gun. (laughs) 
sorry, this story is just so freaking insane. <laughs> so at this point, Patterson has no other choice but to follow his companion and go up the tree as well. Like, what else is he going to do? He's out of bullets. So he climbs up and gets the freaking gun from his companion. And he takes another shot. Also, just like a scene out of a movie, Patterson just barely makes it up the tree in time before the lion jumps back up and tries to attack him again. So Patterson's up in the tree. He grabs the other gun. He aims, takes another shot. And this time, the lion fell over and lied motionless. Patterson climbed down the tree to investigate, and the lion jumped back up again and charged him. Patterson shot him again, this time in the head and chest. And finally, finally, the lion falls for the last time. Just five yards from Patterson's feet. And this lion was similar to the size of the other one. It was nine feet and six inches, and its skin was also severely scarred. It's estimated these lions weighed somewhere between 350 and 400 pounds. So these are big old boys. This lion also did not have a mane. And Patterson claimed that these lions were responsible for the deaths of 135 workers, possibly up to 300. This first lion was killed December 9th, 1898, and the second lion was killed 20 days later on December 29th. After this, the railway was soon completed. Patterson then returned to his home in London, and for a while, he kept both of the lion's skins and skulls. And in 1907, he released his book, The Man-Eaters of Savo. Eventually, in 1924, Patterson sold the skulls and the skins of the lions, but at that time, they were in very poor condition. He sold these to the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, and the lions were reconstructed, but the skins had been in such poor condition that they shrunk a lot. So the lions were like reconstructed, and they're now on permanent display along with their skulls at the museum, but they appear a lot smaller than what they were before. So flashing forward to the 2000s, case studies started to be done on these lions to figure out why the heck they were eating everybody. In 2001, a review about causes for man-eating behavior among lions was done, and they basically concluded that this death toll of over 100 was most likely an exaggeration. However, this study also noted that Patterson's journal only mentioned the deaths of Indian workers, and conveniently left out any deaths of African workers, though Patterson did mention in his journal that there were a lot more deaths among the African workers. But for whatever reason, he didn't keep count of them, just the British Indian workers. Another study that was published in 2009 involved analysis of the lion's bone collagen and hair keratin. And apparently by doing this and looking at some other data, the scientists were able to determine what the lions had been eating. So it's pretty interesting. They determined that one of the lion's diets was 30% humans, and the other lion's diet was far less than that. This study claimed that based on these findings, between the two lions, only about 35 people would have been killed, and that the vast majority of their diet would have been of herbivores. But Patterson also claimed that many of these human victims were herbivores in a sense, because they were vegetarian. If these victims were not meat eaters, this would not leave behind the same signature as a victim would that did consume meat. So this could affect the outcome of the test, essentially, and make it look like the lions were eating herbivores when they were actually eating, like, potentially more humans that just didn't eat meat. Hopefully that makes sense. Additionally, there seemed to be many victims that the lions either didn't fully consume or didn't eat at all, which would make sense according to, like, Patterson's, you know, reports that the lions would get scared off sometimes or... 
they would just seem to like attack the victims and not eat them, almost like it was a sport. So let's get into some theories. There have been several presented uh, in regards to what could have been causing this horrifying behavior with these lions. First, while it's quite uncommon for lions to hunt in pairs, it's not unheard of. Lions have sometimes been known to hunt in what's called a bachelor group with two or more male lions. It's possible that these two Savo man-eaters were brothers, young male lions without a pride, so they formed a small partnership. In regards to the mystery of why they hunted humans, there are also several theories. Some people believe this could have been the result of an outbreak of rinderpest or cattle plague, which would have devastated the lion's original food source and forced them to look for food in other forms. Another theory was basically that because of all the deaths from the slave caravans near this area, the lions had grown accustomed to finding dead humans around and perhaps got comfortable feeding off of them. The East African slave trade, Zanzibar, was known to routinely cross the river near this area. And a big theory came about in 2017, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Bruce Patterson and his team, which found that one of the lions was missing three lower incisors and had a broken canine and a sizable abscess in the tissue surrounding another tooth's root. And the second lion had damage to its mouth with a fractured upper tooth showing exposed pulp. In regards to the first lion, pressure on this abscess would be extremely painful, and this would make it really hard for the lion to hunt its typical prey. This is because the skin of zebras and wildebeests, things that they most commonly consume, are incredibly tough and chewy. This could potentially explain why these lions were hunting humans that have much softer and less chewy skin. Zebras and wildebeests are also, of course, much wider than the typical human, so opening their jaws super wide and trying to lock down on this kind of prey would be a lot harder than locking their jaws down on a human being. This doctor also concluded that it was highly unlikely that when Patterson was hearing the lions crunching on bones, um, he basically said it was highly unlikely that they could have been crunching on bones because of their teeth being in this state. This is also a common conclusion that's drawn in other man-eating cases in lions and other big cats like tigers. But with that being said, according to the museum's findings, the cat was still eating other herbivores, so it still doesn't fully explain why this could have been happening. Like, it was still sometimes eating donkeys and goats, and those have thicker and chewier hides. So why was it still attacking the humans so much, you know? Larissa DeSantis, a paleontologist at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, believes the lions were simply being opportunistic. They were targeting humans because they were plentiful and easy to catch and had soft flesh. She also thinks that this bone crunching sound that Patterson described was more than likely the work of a pack of hyenas. So we don't really know when all of this first started either, like when the lions started feeding. We just know that this was going on when Patterson arrived in Kenya. So it could have been going on much longer before. There was also a theory that the lions could have lost their manes due to the tough conditions and the thorns in this area. So basically they like thinned out and came off. Another theory is that both of the lions had unusually high testosterone levels, which could explain them not only losing their manes, but also being highly aggressive. So it's basically like roid rage in lions or male pattern baldness. Some people think they could have just been doing this for the thrill of it too. And the land that these workers were building on was sacred. So perhaps there was a curse or some really pissed off spirits. Who knows? 
So similar to the story of the man-eaters of Savo, there is the story of the Mafuwe man-eating lion, which was one of the largest man-eating lions on record, being over 10 feet long and 500 pounds. And this lion was killed in Zambia in 1991 by a man named Wayne Hosick. The lion had eaten six humans in the area, and it is also on display in the Field Museum in Chicago, where the Savo man-eaters are. So if you're ever in Chicago and you stop by the Field Museum, be sure to check this out. And that is the perplexing story of the ghost and the darkness. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, learned something new, found something interesting. If you did, tell your friends, tell your family, tell the world, and be sure to leave a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. Be sure, if you're watching on YouTube, to hit the thumbs up button, like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can also hit the bell notification button to basically keep up with when a new episode has come out. And if you have requests for stories, or if you have a crazy story, if you've had an experience with a lion, I don't know, or if you have a paranormal story, a true crime story, it can be anything. I want to hear about it. Send me your stories at perplexitymysterypodcast at gmail, or feel free to DM me on Instagram, which is perplexitymysterypodcast. Also, if you're listening on the podcast, don't forget to take those polls. Let me know your thoughts. Thank you guys so much for listening. I love that you're here and I so appreciate it. I hope you have an awesome week and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.